good to be back with you to open up the Word of God. And uh, we continue today in John chapter 14. If you have a Bible, please turn there. If you do not have a Bible, there are Bibles in the pews around you. As we have been in this section of Scripture, it can feel like what we've covered these last couple months has been a long period, but actually we've looked at really one conversation that has happened between Jesus and His disciples. Uh, This is the eighth sermon in what is known as the Farewell Discourse. These are the final words that Jesus has chosen to deliver to His disciples before His departure. And as we've seen, as we've seen, um, these are words of much encouragement and strength and comfort for their uh, troubled souls, as he said in thirty-one, uh, verse one of chapter fourteen. Let not your hearts be troubled. That he might leave them with some hope. Right? He knows the difficulty that is coming. First, of course, with his death, and in just about 24 hours, he's going to go to the cross. They're going to be confused, filled with despair. Did we miss all this? How in the world is he dead? How could they kill him? How could he die? Right? And then he comes back to life, but then there is much opposition that they will face in the coming weeks and in the coming years. Imagine if you had only a few days to live and you knew that it was your final hours. And you had your loved ones, your children, your family, your friends by your side. Think of what you might want to impart in them, the most important things that you wanted to leave them with before you departed this earth. That is what we are witnessing here in uh, this farewell discourse. It starts, at least the discourse does, in verse 31 of John 13 and goes all the way through John chapter 17. So these, because it's one long dialogue, These sermons have been kind of building off one another. There's some overlap, and we will see some of that again today. So I'm going to pick up in John 14, verse 15. Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and He will give you another Helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. You know Him, for He dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you yet a little while, and the world will see Me no more, but you will see Me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in My Father, and you in Me, and I in you. Whoever has My commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves Me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me and does or does not keep my words... And the word that you hear is not mine, but it is the Father's who sent me. Let's ask God's blessing on this time. Father, do come now again before you, uh, just in a great awareness of my own weakness, inabilities. Pray, God, for your strength. Pray for divine wisdom and power. Pray that you might speak by your Spirit through your servant. Pray that your word would be blessed that it would accomplish its perfect purpose in our souls. Pray for someone here, Lord, that may be outside of Christ, that may not truly know You as Lord and Savior, that You might be gracious, that You might be pleased today to grant repentance and faith. Pray for a Christian today that may be doubting, questioning who they are in You. What is their real standing? Are You really there? Do You hear their prayers? Pray that You might grant today great assurance Pray for anyone that might be ensnared in any sort of sin, God, that you might grant deliverance, that you might lovingly bring your fatherly correction as you do for our good and for your glory. We just ask, Lord, we depend upon you for all times, and we do so specifically right now. Please bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Well, as difficult as it is, it's helpful at times to try to place ourselves in the place of the people that are hearing these words for the first time, to kind of sense maybe some of the magnitude, some of the awe of what they heard from Christ. If you consider the relationship that Jews had with God, how they understood God, their, their, their relations were fairly external. They saw God as holy other, as He certainly is. He is high and lifted up. He is transcendent. There is God and then there is everything else. Right? And there is an infinite chasm between God and His creatures. But because of that, they saw God as in many ways hard to relate to, frightening even at times. And Jesus begins in this text to unpack the, number one, the persons of the Trinity, that they are more and more kind of understanding this threeness and oneness in God, but also then the fellowship that saints can have with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. And what a mysterious yet glorious truth that it is that sinners can become saints and have fellowship with the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. So that's what we're going to focus on today. God's promise, I believe, in this text, fellowship with the Trinity. And then in two weeks, next time I preach, Bob's going to be manning the pulpit next week. The following week, I will um, preach again, and we will see then our response to this fellowship that we have in this same passage. This sermon became a a two-parter. So, firstly, God's promise, fellowship with the Trinity. The first promise we see is that He will give you a helper. He is going to give a helper. Look at verse 16. And I will ask the Father, and He will give you another helper, besides Jesus, to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. You know Him, for He dwells with you and will be in you. So Jesus speaks of a, another helper that is to come. And we read on and see that this is none other than the Spirit of God. He is the Spirit of truth. But this word that Jesus uses, that John has here, is very significant. The word helper. Uh, it is the word paraclete or paracletus in the, the Greek. And it's a word that's difficult to translate into English in one word. And you can know that not by being a Greek scholar or even know much Greek at all, but by looking at all the different translations and see that they all use a different word here, trying to capture what this word is, how to define the Spirit of God as our paraclete. Uh, some translations, as the ESV says, helper. Yours might say advocate, counselor, comforter. All these various words trying to define this one word. And all of these, I think, kind of capture the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He is our advocate. And that word is taken from a courtroom. It's a legal word. It means someone who stands in a trial on behalf of another. And the Spirit of God is our advocate. He stands as our representative. He, he advocates for us. We were talking about prayer in the Sunday school hour, and we saw that the Holy Spirit intercedes and prays when we don't know what we ought to Pray with groanings too deep for words. And what a blessing that it is when we come to God with trivial, temporal prayers or God is doing something over here that we are absolutely missing that the Spirit of God comes and intercedes on our behalf. He advocates for us. He is a counselor, it is said. Maybe your translation says counselor. And He is the Spirit of truth. As a counselor, He teaches the saints. He illuminates the truth for believers. As any good counselor does, he points us to the truth. He is a helper. And the word literally means, it's two words that means one who is called to come alongside. That's what a a paraclete is. And he is the one that comes along our side to help us. It was interesting today, I saw this word in a couple translations from different countries, non-English Bibles. And every country, it seems, kind of has a difficulty translating this word. And some other countries use local idioms, figures of speech that make sense to them to try to 
try to explain the ministry of the Spirit. One Bible, to translate this word, it said, the one who falls down beside us. The Holy Spirit is the one who falls down beside us. And what that means is that someone is, is, is falling out on the side of the road, and he is the one that comes to, he falls on his knees, he gives medical need, care, and he takes them off to their safety. That is the picture there of the Spirit. There's a Bible in Central Africa, and it said in that Bible, the one who mothers us. That's the paraclete, the one who mothers us. And he is lastly, the comforter. He is the one that meets us in our grief, meets us in our trouble and despair, and ministers in our time of need. So all of these words kind of trying to illustrate who or what this helper does, the paraclete, the Spirit of God. Notice Jesus said, He will be with you forever. Christ had a specific time of His earthly ministry. He came to do something, and it had an end, right? It had a goal. And he, of course, accomplished that goal. That goal ultimately was Calvary, that he would go to purchase the redemption of his people and then depart back to the right hand of the Father. But he says here that the ministry of the Spirit is eternal. He will be with you forever. He will never leave your side, Christian. We also see that he is the Spirit of truth, that he speaks and he works on behalf of the truth, on behalf of God's Revelation, meaning the Spirit will never lead us to do something, say something that God the Father and God the Son would not lead us to do or say. We also saw there that He uh, is a gift that the world cannot receive. The ministry of the world of the Spirit is not an act of God's common grace upon the whole world, but it's an act of God's special grace upon the church. The giving of the Spirit is a gift that the world does not partake of. They don't know Him in this sort of saving, advocate, counselor, helper sort of fashion. Now, the Spirit does have a ministry to the world, right? We'll see that later on, that He comes to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So the Spirit of God does interact with those outside of the church, but not in this sort of comforting fashion that that we're promised here. John Owen kind of summed that up with this phrase, union proceeds communion. Before one can have communion with God, the Spirit, one must have union with God. Or to put it another way, faith proceeds fellowship. There is no fellowship with God if one does not first have faith in God. Look again at verse 17. He says, you know Him, speaking of the Spirit, you know Him, for He dwells with you and will be in you. Oftentimes, I think when we read this a text like this, we think of the difference between the Old and New Testament, the Old and New Covenant. In the Old Testament, the Spirit was with believers, and in the New, now He will be in believers. But listen to Sinclair Ferguson. He has something to say here. He says, these words do not refer to the contrast of the relationship between the Spirit and Old and New Covenant believers, even though they're often understood that way. But he says what Jesus is actually saying is you know the Spirit because He is with you in me. All these years, the Spirit of God has been with you because He has dwelt within me, and He will come and be in you at Pentecost. So there He says that He dwells with you because He dwells in Christ. The Spirit of God has been in their midst all along because Christ has been filled with the Spirit all along. But there will be a time where He will come in the church. The Spirit will be poured out in, 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 in a fuller sense at Pentecost. As we think of the Spirit, He comes not to do something new. He doesn't come with a new ministry, a new work. He comes to continue the work that Jesus began. He is the one that comes alongside to empower or to enable the church. So we talked about evangelism earlier. It is the Spirit of God that gives our words any power, right? I mean, even, even the Bible, as it is the living word of the living God, but it is effective into the soul of a person that hears it because God the Spirit so chooses to apply it 
to a person's heart. It is the power of this Spirit that will enable, as Jesus just said last week, or two weeks ago, I think, that Christians will do greater works than He did. Why is that? Not because some strength in us, but because of the giving of the Spirit, that He would pour out His Spirit upon the church. So we are a people completely dependent upon the work of the Spirit. Whether we minister in the church, whether we minister in the street, whether we minister in our homes, whatever we do is we seek to serve Christ and to minister the Word of God, we are completely dependent on His Spirit to work as He sovereignly wills. Now, there is much more to come in the coming weeks in relation to the ministry of the Spirit as Jesus will continue to kind of unpack His ministry. Secondly, as we consider the fellowship that we have with the Trinity, we see the second promise of life in the Son through union with the Son. A Christian has life in Christ through union with Christ. Look at verse 19 there. Because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know <clears throat> that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Because I live, you also will live. Now I would wager that these words didn't have that great of an impact right then in that moment. I think if I can just make an assumption that the apostles were at times grappling with, what, what does that mean? You know, what, what, is, what is he saying? But they didn't really fully understand at times the weight of what he said. But then in a 24 or so hour period, Christ is dead. And they're in despair. What in the world did we miss? How did we not see this coming? What do we do now? Is this whole thing over? How do we press on? Our, our leader, our Lord, our Messiah is gone. And three days later, there He is alive, gloriously resurrected. And as they're just grappling, awestruck with the reality that here He is, and as He meets His disciples on the, on the road to Emmaus, opens up their minds to understand in Moses and the prophets and the writings and all of the Old Testament all of the things that spoke to him points to them that Christocentric nature of the whole Bible, that the whole thing speaks of Christ and pointed to him all along. As he told the Pharisees, you know, you search the scriptures because you think that in them, in the ink on the page, you have eternal life, but it is they that speak of me. And he condemns them in the beginning of his earthly ministry that they did not understand that. That the whole of the Bible points to Christ. It is a revelation of the coming of the incarnate Son of God. And as they're grappling with this, I can imagine them looking back as they're plowing through the Old Testament saying, wow, there's Christ. Wow, there's Jesus. But also thinking back to the things that He taught. Remembering these words, because I live, you will also live. And then understanding that in light of His resurrection. Every time we have a baptism, in a church, the congregation is reminded of our union with Christ, that we've been united to Jesus in His death, in His burial, and in His resurrection. Paul says if we've been united with Him in a death like His, we shall certainly be united with Him in a resurrection like, this, like His. And praise be to God, right? One of the purposes then of baptism is to demonstrate that a believer has died. Right, their life is over. They've died with Christ. That that old man has been buried in the tomb. But praise be to God, he has been gloriously resurrected. And as we come out of the waters of baptism, we see that resurrection life pictured visibly for all to see. The gospel on full display. As we take communion, we have communion with Christ in the supper through our union with Him. The bread, of course, represents His broken body that, he, that was broken on behalf of sinners, on behalf of the body of Christ, and the wine represents His blood that was shed for sinners. And because of His death, because He died as a substitute on our behalf, we then have union with Him in those things and communion with Him. And it is this attribute, this life in 
Christ, as Jesus says, because I live, you also will live. It is this attribute that separates true believers from everyone else. There's only two types of people in this world. I know, especially in our day of identity politics and all of that, we love our tribes, right? Black, right, white, left, right, all of the in-between, all of the ways that we identify people culturally, geographically, and even in the church, right? We have all of our various tribes and denominations and all of the stuff. But there is only two types of people, in Adam or in Christ. Are you dead in Adam, or are you alive in Jesus Christ? And for some that profess faith in Jesus, their life is now bound up in Christ. Meaning all that you do is with, for, and to Jesus. Now you could say with the Apostle Paul, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It means my life has been crucified. Brett White was, was pinned to a tree, and praise be to God, that old wretch is dead. Right? He is buried in the backyard. He no longer lives, but it is now Christ who lives in me. And if you have life in Christ, then, beloved, you are alive in Him. That means you're trusting, following, submitting, believing. All of life is all of Christ. But for others who profess faith in Jesus, He is merely an add-on to that little religious part of your week, part of your life. He he becomes an accessory. For some, Jesus is fairly inconsequential. His word has little power in your life. The demands that he places on your life are, are easily disregarded. He has not much influence, impact on what you do, who you are. There's not much draw to Jesus, but he's a small addition or accessory. And I ask you today, which side of the equation do you see yourself? When you go throughout your week, is there a dependence upon the Lord? Is there a seeking of Christ daily? Is there a love? Not a sappy, superficial, I love Jesus, but a love for Christ and His Word and His church and His people. Or is church just a thing that's relegated to Sunday morning? Is Jesus just relegated to what you do on Sunday, if there's not other things going on. But a true Christian is one that lives because he lives. He in you and you in him. It's one that's been recreated, renewed by the Spirit of God, meaning your heart has been ripped out. That old, stony, callous, hard heart that lived for self has been ripped out and you've been given a heart transplant a fleshly, soft heart that loves God, that loves the things of God, certainly that battles and struggles. It is an imperfect walk. The most loving, faithful Christian sins daily. But certainly, if you've been given that new heart, there is a new love for Christ and the things of God. Paul says, and we all ought to say, it is no longer I who live. I am now on life support. I find my life wholly trusting in Christ. And apart from Him, I can do nothing. And as believers that have been united to Christ, that have life in Christ, we now have communion with God the Son. I want to read to you a section out of a little book called Communion with God. I highly recommend it. It's written by John Owen. Um, He's known as the Prince of... Puritans, he writes in the 1600s, kind of notoriously difficult to read, but this little volume has been abridged and kind of modernized for us modern folk. But this is what he has to say about the communion that we have with Christ. He says, this fellowship is like a delicious banquet. It is delightful. 
This love of Christ is better than wine. It is not food and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. He says, gospel promises are delicious morsels. The grace shown by Christ in his ordinances is refreshing, strengthening, and full comfort to the souls of the saints. Woe to such souls who loathe those sweet honeycombs. He says, Christ makes all his assemblies banquet houses. He pictures there the church as a place where believers come to feast on the riches of Christ as manna from heaven that feeds needy souls. And he goes on to say this fellowship, that we commun- this communion we have with Christ is where the soul finds safety, strength, and comfort. And I ask you today, dear Christian, do you know this sort of communion with Christ? Do you see it as delightful, as a joy, as better than the the, the most, the richest things that this world could ever offer? Do you fellowship with the Lord in this way? Are you growing in His graces? Are you feeding off His Word? Are you comprehending, as Paul says in Ephesians, with all the saints, the breadth and height and the depth of His love? to just meditate and ponder the love that God has through Christ in the church and for His saints. There is a rich bounty that awaits the soul that delights in Christ. But oh, how often is it, beloved, that we ignore this rich banquet. There is a feast, an abundant blessing that Christ offers, but we settle for junk food. We settle for trivial things of this world, temporal little pleasures that tickle our flesh when there is a banquet to behold in Christ. The other day I was here at the church and I was uh, getting ready to leave and I let Erica know I was coming home and she asked me if I could stop by the grocery store and pick up some produce, right? She was making dinner and was lacking one thing and I went to the store, Fred Meyer, and I just have to confess to you, church, that in that place is many temptations, many things that try to draw away the, the appetites of the flesh. And I was there and, and I had this, this thought, you know, I'm, I'm going to the store, I'm, I'm, I'm helping out. It's all right if I get myself a, a treat, right, a, a snack. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I'm at the store. So I confess I have a, I have a, a weakness in the area of sour, gooey sort of candies. So I grabbed this candy off the shelf, you know, and I was wise. I ate it before I got home. <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and I left it in the car. Um, so we had dinner, and it didn't spoil my dinner. I ate, but Erica had made this, you know, she's trying to feed us healthy. So it was grass-fed, organic, all, nothing boxed, you know, food from the earth. And I had this great meal, and I had this, this, this idea. I said, you know, I think this might be true. Do you think it's true if you eat a bunch of junk food, And then you eat a meal like this, that it kind of just erases all of the... (laughs) And she said, what did you do? (laughs) You just carb loaded and you ruined the whole thing. Now you just, you know. Um, But we so often, we settle for silly little things like that that do no good for our soul. And Christ is there. There's a a bounty of riches, of of manna from heaven, and we're, we're eating the scraps off of the ground that have fallen off of the table. There is life in Him through union with Him. And through that union, we share this beautiful, glorious communion with our Savior. Lastly, promise number three, the love of the Father. The love of the Father. Verse 21, Jesus says, He who loves me will be loved by my Father. And then in verse 23, Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. You see this kind of beautiful familial relation here? Jesus said earlier, he promised that I will not leave you as orphans. I will not leave you as orphans. And he says here that whoever keeps my word, whoever loves me, my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. You see this nearness 
this closeness. And the fellowship that we have with the Father is experienced and seen primarily through our adoption. Through our adoption, we relate to Him as sons and daughters that have been brought in as fellow heirs, joint heirs with Christ. What that means, beloved, if you are here today and your faith is placed in Jesus, that we are a spiritual family. That we as the body of Christ are, are heirs of a king. That our Father in heaven is a, is a king. In one sense, we are a, a royal family with royal privileges. Adoption was nothing new in the ancient world. Think about Moses in the book of Exodus. He was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter as a Hebrew and brought into this family and made a prince. But he was given the rights as an heir. You're probably familiar with the name in history, uh, Julius Caesar. He was an emperor, and his grand nephew was a man named Octavius. And, and Julius Caesar put in his will that Octavius was to be named his heir and his adopted son. And Octavius later on becomes Caesar Augustus, given all the rights and the privileges to be a king because he was adopted into this family of a king. And so it is as Christians that we have been adopted in and we have become fellow heirs. We have all the rights, all of the privileges as a son, a natural son by birth. The Baptist Catechism asks the question, what is adoption? And it says simply there that adoption is an act of God's free grace by which we are received into the number and have a right to all of the privileges of the sons of God. There is no class system within the body of Christ. We may have roles within the church, people doing different things as different parts of the body, but there is one people that are either sons or daughters and have the full privileges as those sons or daughters. But how do we experience this adopting love of the Father. As Paul says, we've received the spirit of adoption so that we can cry, Abba, Father. It's this intimate way to speak of God. How do we experience this adopting love of the Father? Three ways. Uh, number one, through His fatherly guidance and direction. The Father guides His children. Just like any loving father seeks to love and to guide and direct his children, to kind of try to keep them on the path for their good, so it is that our earthly Father, or our heavenly Father, excuse me, guides and directs His children. We experience His loving, His adopting love through this guidance. And He does this primarily through providence. Providence is what uh, John Piper has described as His purposeful sovereignty. His purposeful sovereignty, His acts in our lives through His sovereign hand to lead and direct. I've read this many times. I want to read it again because I think it's rich and very pastoral. Uh, I think we talked about this a couple weeks back in our midweek study. But it's the 27th question out of the Heidelberg Catechism. And it says, what do you understand by the providence of God? What do you understand by the providence of God? What does this mean? Providence is the almighty, everywhere present power of God, whereby, as it were, by His hand, he upholds heaven and earth with all creatures. That's everything other than God. And he so governs them that herbs and grass, rain and drought, fruitful and barren years, meat and drink, health and sickness, riches and poverty, indeed all things come to us not by chance, but by His fatherly hand. Our Father in heaven is active in creation through providence. So much so that we can trust that whatever comes our way comes through His fatherly care. As He says, does a sparrow fall to the ground apart from Me? Look at the lilies of the field, how, they, how I clothe them. Those aren't just cute statements, but God is saying, I'm at work everywhere. How much more can you trust Me as we discussed in Sunday school? That means rain or shine, and there it is. Look, the sun's come out, praise be to God. But if it was gloomy and pouring rain, praise be to God, right? That means sickness and health. As difficult as sickness can be, we can trust that God is guiding. That means full years 
and lean years. When everything is good and the bank account's full and the bank and the bills are being paid, or when there's questions every week and every month, and there's that sinking sense in the pit of your stomach when another bill comes in the mail and you have no idea how in the world I'm going to pay for this thing. God is on His throne and He is working and providing as any good father would. He is the perfectly good father. What this means is you consider the reality of God guiding and directing His people. As we consider providence, biblical providence, what that means is that Romans 8.28 is fact and not fiction. That means that Romans 8.28 is not just a quaint, pithy statement that looks good on a coffee cup. It's not just a little thing that we, that we throw out when someone's struggling to kind of appease you know, their despair in that moment. But, it, but the reason that Romans 8.28 is so good and so filled with hope for believers is because God works through providence and that everything comes from His hand. Paul says, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. What that means, believer, right now, no matter how dark, no matter how grim things look, no matter how many questions that you have about the future, no matter how hopeless today is, how lost you may feel, how distant God may seem, how, however your circumstance might look, that there is absolutely no earthly situation that could ever make any good or fix anything that's happening right here and right now. God is working it for good. God is chiseling you as an artist takes a chunk of rock and turns it into a beautiful statue. He is chiseling away day by day, year by year, conforming you into the image of His Son that you would grow more and more in Christ's likeness. He is preparing for you that day when you will enter into glory in everything that comes your way. Everything that comes your way, He uses for the good of your soul. In the fires of tribulation, it is hard at times to see that. Is it not? It is difficult to believe that any good can come out of some of the stuff that we go through. But God promises, and of course we take God at His word, and we trust His promises, and that means that that word is true for us. And He does all of that as a father caring for His adopted sons and daughters. Secondly, we, we uh, experience this adopting love because now for Christians, all of His promises are sure. All of His promises are sure. You read the Scriptures now, beloved, as a son or as a daughter. You read the Bible as an heir, not as an outsider, not as someone who has just picked up some foreign book that you're trying to comprehend, but you read the Word of God as a message from your Father. And what Father withholds good gifts from the Son that He loves? Thomas Watson, another Puritan, in his book, A Body of Divinity, he speaks of this, that the promises in the Scripture are sure from the Lord. He says, in the dark night of desertion, God has promised to be a shining sun. In temptation, He promises to tread down Satan. In loneliness, He promises to never leave your side. When your hope vanishes. He is the one that brings comfort to the soul. When enemies rise up against you, He promises that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. When a charge is brought against His elect, He promises that there is no condemnation because He is the one who justifies, who has declared you right before Him. And when earthly treasures are destroyed, snatched away from us in a moment, he has given an imperishable inheritance to His sons and daughters. He who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, how will He not also with Him graciously give us all things? Romans 8.32 And Watson wraps up that section. He says this, There is not a promise in the Bible that a believer cannot say, This is mine. This is for me. 
And then lastly, how do we experience this love of our adoptive father? We experience it through loving discipline. Through loving discipline. And this is the part that we all love, right? This is the part that we all love, the rod of our father. Proverbs chapter 3, and verse 11, it says there, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. Discipline comes from the loving hand of a loving father, and it is for our good. It is for our benefit, again, that we might grow in Christ's likeness and that we might be kept from harming ourselves with our sin. Imagine if you had a home that backed up to a railroad track and you had kids and they just loved to play on the tracks. They loved to pull out the railroad spikes, the ones that had come out or were loose. They loved to pretend that they were trains and line up all their things and play. But a few times a day, you had to, you had to grab them up. You had to warn them, get off the track, right? It's unsafe. You cannot play there. It's time to come in. Get away from the track. And the child, as a child does not understand these things, might say, why do you always take from me? This is the place that I love to be. This is the funnest time of the day that we get to play with our friends on the track. And the child sees that as something that you've taken from them. But any loving parent would understand that it would be a wicked thing to not protect our children on a railroad track. That it would be actually evil for us to stand back and allow them to stay out there when there was an active train potentially coming. Or with a fire, when you have a child and they're drawn to, the, to a campfire. You know, a young child sees that fire and it kind of dazzles the eye and it darts back and forth and they just want to reach out and touch it. But out of love, we keep them from harming themselves, from burning themselves, and so it is with our own sin. It's like that fire, it has an allure to it. It, it dazzles the eye. It looks good. It looks like it's something that we want to grab hold of, that we want to partake of. But every time that we do, we find ourselves burned. We, we taste its sting time and time again. And the Father's discipline is meant to protect us from our own ruin and our destruction. The author to the Hebrews, he cites that section of Proverbs, and then he continues on in verse 12 of Hebrews chapter 7. And he says, it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but He disciplines us for our good that we may share in His holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. You hear there that the Father is treating you as a son when He brings discipline upon his children and he does so for our good that we might share in his holiness but there is a sobering word in those verses that if you are left without discipline then you are actually an illegitimate son if you can go on in licentious living walking in sin practicing sin living in sin as a lifestyle and not feel the hard end of God's rod, you may have to ask yourself, why is that? Why does my Heavenly Father not correct me? Why do I never taste or experience His discipline? Why can I go on sinning week after week, year after year, and never sense the corrective hand of my Father? But if you fall, if you do something foolish and you feel the swift end of the Father's wrath, 
Praise be to God that your heavenly Father loves you and desires your good, and that He seeks to correct you, to, to keep you from destruction, keep you from ruin. Well, beloved, we have honestly scratched the surface on what it means to have fellowship with the triune God. We have, we have touched just the tip of, of the iceberg. We could talk about this topic unto eternity. But I pray, as we close, I pray that you know God in this way, as Jesus speaks of today. I pray that you know the help and comfort of the Spirit. That He is leading you and guiding you. That He meets you in your affliction, in your strife, in your um, affliction, in your, in your struggles. I pray that you know the, the new heart and new life of what it means to be alive in Christ. That you are living today for Christ. This world wants to suck us in and distract us and deaden our faith and keep us from having a vibrant, living faith. The enemy cannot touch your standing before God. He cannot take away your forgiveness in Christ. But he can make you utterly ineffective and put you on the bench that your light would be out and extinguished. But I pray that you know today that you're experiencing what it means to live as He lived. He came from, back from the dead, beloved. Amen. He was dead, and now He's alive. And you too were dead, but God, and now you are alive. Praise be to God for that truth. And lastly, I pray that you know the fatherly love and care of your adoption, that you are experiencing the guidance and love of the Father, that you know in your heart that His promises are sure for you. Beloved, there is no question. When you open up the Bible, you never have to say, is this for me? Because in Christ, all of His promises are yea and amen. Lastly, if this is foreign to you, if you don't know God in this way, if you've come to church today and and you can leave this place and go up about your week never considering Christ, never seeking Him, never praying to Him, never calling upon His name, if you don't know the comfort of the Spirit, if you don't know the life of Christ, if you don't know what it means to, to be led and cared for by your Father, I exhort you today, call upon His name. Faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of Christ, and all who call upon His name are saved. Without exception, Jesus Christ is a perfect Savior to any that would come to Him. And when Jesus began His earthly ministry, He said these words, Repent and believe in the gospel. Turn from your sin and turn to Me in faith. Believe that these promises are for you, that Jesus Christ is not a Savior. He is the only Savior. He is the only way to God. No one comes to the Father except through Him. Turn today from whatever it is that has your heart, whatever it is that has taken your gaze off of Him and placed it firmly upon Christ and Him crucified. Union must precede communion. There can be none of this sweet fellowship None of these sweet blessings until you have truly repented and believed upon Christ. Let's pray.